on this day, the 21st of January, 1793, Louis XVI, King of France and Navarre, was executed by guillotine in the Place de la Révolution. This marked the end of the thousand-year monarchy that had been in France and it marked the beginning of a turbulent time for France that some maintain has not yet been completed. Louis became king at the age of 19, which is incredible considering that my, when I was eight, 19, being in charge of a nation like France would have been daunting. And it was daunting for him. His grandfather, Louis XV, that's, yeah, Louis XV had died. Um, Louis's father had died before he could become king. And so he was there at the age of 19 with an 18-year-old wife, 1774, just before the American Rebellion began. France was economically in ruins. It was beset with a government that had not reformed itself for over a hundred years. Things were looking bad. His grandfather, Louis XV, had fam famously said, After me, the deluge. It's almost as if he pros prophesied the revolution to come. And he left it to this poor young fella to try to sort it out. Louis XVI, as opposed to many of the caricatures of him, being a tyrant and an absolutist and terrible man, he tried to institute many different reforms in France um, alongside the Enlightenment values. So he was taught by men who themselves were inspired by Enlightenment values and they wanted things to change and they had influenced him in his education. Some of the things he attempted were to abolish serfdom, remove the land tax and labor tax. He wanted to increase religious tolerance towards non-Catholics. Uh, he wanted to abolish de the death penalty for deserters in the army. And in most of these cases, he was opposed by the peers of France. So he would, at this time, it's uh, important to understand, French government was Byzantine in its structure. Unlike in Great Britain, where there was one free trade area for the whole country, so you could put your goods in a, in a, sh a ship or in a trailer and send them up to uh, Edinburgh or to Wales or to the to Lincolnshire or down to Cornwall and you didn't have to pay any taxes at any point when you crossed a bridge or when you crossed a county line or when you went into a city or out of a city it was a free trade area France didn't have that within France there were numerous internal borders. Some provinces were small and you had to pay taxes to go into them and out of them. Some cities demanded it. There were chunks of France, some larger, some smaller, that were trade zones that you didn't have to pay within that trade zone, but who the hell knew where it, all these borders began? So, and many of these peers had rights to the taxes on those borders and bridges and into towns and out of towns. So they were very much against 
uh, standardizing taxes, at, because none of these taxes were going to the state, they were going to individuals. Many of the individuals would actually pay a bribe, a large bribe, to be able to get one of these positions, then they would have income for doing nothing, they could sit at court and conspire with other people, and then they could leave it to their son when they die, unless the, their family died out and then it was up for auction again. So France was Byzantine. They had numerous parliaments, and parliaments were like law courts rather than parliaments. They had numerous different areas where different laws applied. The north of France uh, went by common law, so similar to English law. The southern part was Roman law. It was all over the place. And Louis was trying to standardize and streamline these things. But the vested interests of the aristocracy opposed him. Many reforms associated with the French Revolution were actually begun under Louis. Things such as the metric system, because again, in France, there wasn't one system of weights and measures. There were numerous ones. You've probably heard of Troy ounces. Well, there would have been Paris ounces, and there would have been Bordeaux ounces, and Provencal ounces and Breton ounces. He wanted to standardize it. And when the people who had been going and researching this came back, they came back with the metric system and it was in the middle of the French Revolution. French revolutionaries loved it and imposed it on France. They loved standardizing things. But also, things like the departements. So again, it's this is very much associated with the French Revolution. And, but this, again, was a reform that had been started under Louis, because, again, he wanted to streamline administration within France. It probably wouldn't have gone as far as it did under the revolutionaries. He probably would have kept the provinces, and this would have been an extra level of... Um, administration, but it did start under him. Things like instituting the guillotine for the death penalty. This was something that started before he called the Estates General. So many of the reforms associated with the French Revolution actually began with Louis. Anyway, <coughs> His support, early support, so he's 19, he's at the front of the throne, 20 years old, and he decides to go all in on the American Revolution. At this point, it had not been very long since France's defeat and humiliation during the Seven Years' War. And he, and France generally, wanted vengeance for that defeat. Louis wanted Canada back. He wanted number of islands in the Caribbean. He wanted Jamaica. He wanted lots of land. And he wanted to weaken Britain. On a side note, he was also the only French king that was fluent in English. So he was able to speak directly to people like Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson and the British ambassador. And so he went all in with the American rebels. Now, it's a bit strange thinking about this, but he goes in and supports the rebellion of one people against their king, and then, because of that, he bankrupts himself, ending in a revolution against him by his people who then execute him. It's almost like that came back on him 
but whatever happened, he did support the Americans. Now, during the war with Britain, instead of using taxes, because it's almost impossible to raise taxes in France, because most of the taxation is going to certain wealthy landed people who have um, a monopoly on collecting taxes in certain bridges or crossings over borders within France. So he can't really raise tax, so his finance guy goes out and borrows money. Borrows a lot of money. Eventually, they borrow over 1,000 million livres, which I've looked up, and it leaves means a pound. It's a pound of silver. Over a billion pounds of silver. And that would come to about $360 billion today, which doesn't really sound too much considering that we, we have multi-trillion dollar bailouts every second day now. But back then, it was real money. They couldn't print it. it had to be backed by something. Although, is there even a billion pounds of silver in the world? Hmm. There must be. So France didn't have any money, and the last thing they wanted to do was tax France. Well, he did, but the peers of France didn't. The only way around this would be to call an Estates General. That would be the only way in which he could legally raise taxes, and he had to because Louis wasn't a tyrant. If he was a tyrant, he could have insisted. He could have just abolished all these, um, the, all the tax farming that all these lords were doing. Could have abolished that and said, nope, I'm going to, I'm going to take all of that money. I will raise taxes how I want, when I want. But Louis XVI was no Stalin. He was encumbered by tradition, by law and by custom, and he only had one way out. Now calling the Estates General was a very good idea, however, it was hijacked by people who weren't really that concerned with money, they were concerned with governance. And not unfairly, because France, as I said, was a mess. And very quickly, the French Revolution began. And remember, the French Revolution isn't the part where they start cutting heads off. It was the part where they revolutionized governance. So they created a standardized uh, free trade area that included all of France. This was probably the most important thing they did. They abolished all the different trade regions, the tariff areas, and they integrated them all into one French tariff. That by itself was incredibly radical. The next thing they did, we hear equality of law. What they meant was every part of France would be ruled by the same laws. Instead of Brittany having this law, the north of France having this law, Flanders having that, Languedoc having this, Provence having that. Instead of having different regions of laws and different types of laws, there's going to be one law. Quality under the law. And then they abolished serfdom and they abolished the, the privileges of the aristocracy, meaning that they could be taxed. Again, these are many things that Louis wanted to do. So he did not oppose it, he, he approved it. Now, creating the National Assembly was a way to get around this, because you had three estates. One for the burghers, or the bourgeois, as they're called in France. One for the, the peers, and one for the clergy. The clergy and the peers would always uh, vote against what the bourgeois were voting for. So creating the National Assembly 
meant that that wouldn't happen. So it was actually doing Louis a favour, just helping him out. Now, creating a constitutional monarch, again, it wasn't a constitutional monarch in a modern sense. He still would have had, he still had much authority and influence. So again, it wasn't something he was necessarily opposed to. He might have been uncomfortable with it, how quick it was going, but he wasn't opposed to it. It was only when they started going a little bit do lully, so forcing them from Versailles, bringing them into Paris, storming the Bastille, the flouting of uh, the royal person, um, and then puppeteering him around Paris. It was getting dangerous, and that's when he fled. He tried to go to the Austrian Netherlands to get away from an increasingly crazy Paris. And it was this that condemned him. Now, they probably would have found another reason to condemn him. A, the Girondins, Jacobins, they wanted him gone. But this was giving them the excuse. The trial was a foregone conclusion, really, and he knew it was a foregone conclusion. He was trying to ensure that they knew that he had always tried to be a good king. This is probably one of his great weaknesses. You shouldn't want to be loved, you should want to do right rather than be loved. But that's what he wanted. And his cousin, the Duc d'Orléans, Louis Egalité, what a prat, voted for Louis XVI's death. And later that year, he would also be beheaded. Hmm. Although his son would end up becoming king in 1830s. Something came out of it for him. But Louis XVI was then stripped of his title. Came Louis Citizen Louis Capet. Kept in the Temple Tower until the 21st of January, 1793. Brought to the Place de, de la Révolution. Tried to make a speech, but it was cut off and then executed. People were said to have run forward and dipped their, their uh, handkerchiefs in his blood. His head was held up with the crowd. Some people cheered, some people cried. It was a momentous event in the history of France. And it marked the beginning of a more radical period in the French Revolution, which would eventually destroy itself through its radicalism. The execution of Louis XVI, as I said, was a momentous event in French history. Since then, we've had Rest, we've had a revolutionary government, we've had a consulate, we've had the First Empire, a restoration of Louis' brother, and then his other brother, and then a revolution, and then we have Louis Philippe, King of the French, the son of Louis Egalité. Then in 1848, another revolution, Napoleon III comes to power as president, then he becomes emperor, and then there's an invasion from Prussia, and another revolution, and the Third Republic, which stumbles along, everyone hates it, until 1940 when they're invaded again, and we have Vichy France, and then we have a Fourth Republic, and then we have a Fifth Republic. So it's been a bit unstable since. And I would say it's because of this sudden wrenching emotional break with the past. 
Many countries who have become republics didn't become republics in such a devastatingly emotionally wrecking way that France did. Some of them gradually became republics. Others were the monarchy really, really just lost all legitimacy in a way that didn't hadn't done in France at that point. Um, the only other country I can think in which the abolition of the monarchy was as bad would possibly be Russia and how the imperial family was overthrown and then murdered by the Bolsheviks. And to this day, I think it still has an effect. Many on the conservative right in France, they're still monarchists in many ways. Some support the legitimists, some support the Orleanists, some support the Bonapartists. There's three different factions, even now. And so it's still there, over 200 years later. If you like these videos, come back tomorrow and watch another one. Comment, like, and subscribe.